Recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that nearly 1,000 different cookbooks are published each year in America, many of them glossy, full-colored, and very expensive. But at the same time, fewer and fewer people are cooking, and increasing numbers are eating in restaurants. The reporter for the journal interviewed one lady, our portfolio manager in New York. She has acquired 16 cookbooks in the last four years and subscribes to two cooking magazines. But the last time she prepared a set-down meal was four years ago, and, she said, it didn't turn out. Another survey was also conducted and concluded that there are more Bible translations, study aids, and devotional books now than ever. Christian publishing is a big business in America. But for all of that, people are reading and studying their Bible less and less. Do we treat our Bibles like cookbooks? We prize their possession, but never use them. Over the years, these same sentiments have been vocalized by great men of God. Charles Spurgeon, a famous 19th century British Baptist preacher said, There is dust enough on some of our Bibles to write damnation with your fingers. While David F. Nigren, a poet and author said, If all the neglected Bibles were dusted simultaneously, we would have a record dust storm and the sun would go into eclipse for a whole week. John MacArthur, most noted for his radio program, Grace to You said, I have found that my spiritual growth is directly proportionate to the amount of time and effort I put into the study of Scripture. And Arthur T. Pearson, a famous 19th century preacher and missionary said, Every study of the Bible is the study of the evidence of Christianity. The Bible itself is the greatest miracle of all. Most Christians realize the importance the Bible should have in their lives, but they are frustrated by their continual lack of qualified Bible study. Why is this the case with most Christians? I imagine there could be thousands of reasons, but I have narrowed down the excuse list to only three. The first excuse states that Bible study requires an investment of time and our busy schedules do not afford the quality time necessary to complete the task. The second excuse would explain that Bible study is boring and dry. It's just easier to listen to a sermon or teaching CD or a cassette tape. Wilbur M. Smith, professor of English Bible at the Fuller Theological Seminary, addressed this issue. It will probably astonish many to know that one single normal issue of the Saturday Evening Post contains as much reading material as the entire New Testament. Thousands of people read the Saturday Evening Post through every week. The number of Christians who read the Bible through every week or even one book of the New Testament every week are so few that we need not talk about it. The third excuse hides in the assumption that it's difficult to conduct a proper Bible study without the necessary tools and skills. Everyone has excuses, but Michael Green from Illustrations for Bible Preaching summed up our excuses as the skin of reason stuffed with a lie. There are three levels of Bible study and each has their own merits and limitations. The first level is Bible reading. This activity is excellent for all believers because it provides a panorama of the Old and New Testaments. But the gold mine of God's Word will not be examined for His eternal truth. Bible study is the activity that may include a devotional book, a simple concordance, a commentary, and a 20-minute investment of time. This form of Bible involvement encompasses the bulk of Christian interaction with the Holy Scriptures. No doubt diligent Bible study will help the student of the Word to mine some of the truths 
buried in God's Word, but the greater treasures are found by those who engage in Bible research. Bible research is not the same as Bible study. The techniques and disciplines required to conduct this form of in-depth study demands the use of several different research aids. The investment in Bible research may be days, weeks, months, or even years. But don't let this possibility frighten you because Bible research is a technique more than an activity. When you use the proper techniques, our research projects are organized to such a point that we may invest the time that fits our busy schedules. The difference between Bible study and Bible research is the study discipline of organization. The secret to good Bible research is the proper interpretation of the sacred writings. The Bible authors wrote from a perspective unique to them, unique in history, in custom, in language and geography. These four areas create for us four problems that the student of the word must solve in order to successfully interpret the Bible. The first problem the student of the word will confront is the language barrier. The Bible was written in three languages which are not in use today in their ancient form. The three languages are Hebrew, Aramaic, also known as Chaldee, and Koine Greek. The Hebrew language originated from the old Phoenician alphabet. Nearly all alphabets in current use today, Semitic and non-Semitic, find their ancient roots in this alphabet. Nowhere in the Old Testament is the language called Hebrew, but it is referred to as the language of Canaan and the Jews' language. On four occasions, the children of Israel were taken into captivity. Each diaspora resulted in major inner pollutions being introduced into the Hebrew language. Between the 8th and the 6th centuries BC, Tiglath Pilser III carried away the Transjordanic tribes, Shamanser II and the III carried away the northern tribes of Israel, Sennacherib and Nebuchadnezzar took the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin and eventually Jerusalem captive. These captivities caused the Hebrew language to erode to the point that the common people of Israel could not speak their ancestral language. The death of the Hebrew language forced Ezra and Nehemiah to develop the Targums, the translation of the law from Hebrew into Aramaic, in order to bridge the gap between the sacred writings and the people. With the creation of the Targums, the Hebrew language became known as the sacred tongue, reserved only for religious worship and priestly use. Aramaic is a Northwest Semitic dialect believed to have originated in the Mesopotamian area. Should we discard two words that occur in Genesis chapter 31, verse 47, the earliest notice of the use of this language in Scripture is the request made by the representatives of Hezekiah to Rabshakeh, messenger of Sennacherib. We next meet with the Aramaic language in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. Nearly all of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, with the following exceptions that were written in Aramaic. Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, verse 28. Ezra chapter 4, verse 8, through chapter 6, verse 18. And Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. The world conquests of Alexander the Great caused the Greek language to spread throughout the known world. Koine Greek became the common language of communication between nations and peoples. In fact, the word koine is translated common. Alexander's conquests caused the Greek culture to spread into new territories. Often God will select unlikely people to fulfill his will. Alexander the Great was one of these people. 
The Lord used Alexander's love for culture and literature to spread a common language throughout the known world. The most significant byproduct of Alexander's conquest was the publication of the Greek Septuagint. This Bible is a translation of the Hebrew manuscripts by 72 Hellenistic Jewish scholars into Greek. The translations took nearly 40 years to complete from 285 BC to 246 BC. The Septuagint had a definite effect on the establishment and growth of the first century church. In fact, several of Jesus' scriptural quotes are derived from the Septuagint, and the author of the book of Hebrews clearly used this translation. Consider this thought with me. When Jesus ministered the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke to a mixed crowd of people from Decapolis and Perea. And these areas are Greek-speaking Roman colonies. We also see in Mark chapter 7, verse 24 through 31, that Jesus journeyed along the borders of Tyre and Sidon. While in the region of Decapolis, Jesus encountered a Greek a Syrophoenician woman and cast a devil out of her daughter. The discourse Jesus had with this woman was probably in Greek, since Decapolis is a Greek-speaking trade colony established by the Romans. Is it possible that Jesus may have spoken three languages? Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic? On the day of Pentecost, Peter definitely preached in Greek because of the mixed nations present, and the Bible says he was understood by all. Each of these three languages, in their own way, fashioned and formed the written Word of God. When we study the Bible in the English language, we remove ourselves from the linguistic atmosphere the Bible was written in. Now we come to the crux of the language barrier. The English language often does not have word-for-word -word perfect translation. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek are very picturesque. Often it takes more than one English word to accurately translate the original languages. The second problem the student of the word will encounter is the cultural barrier. Often the student of the word will attempt to interpret the Bible according to his or her own cultural perspective. This could cause a distortion of interpretation because the Bible was not influenced by the typical Anglo-European culture. The Bible is an oriental book recording culture, customs, and modes of thinking in an Asian fashion. The customs of Israel today have not changed much since Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. The oriental customs of today are nearly the same as those of ancient times. How can the Anglo-European and the Asian cultures combine in order to become a harmonious universal church? There can be no doubt that the first apostles struggled with this question since they believed the followers of Jesus Christ would be another sect of Judaism similar to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This was not the intention of Jesus when he instructed his disciples to make disciples of all nations. Were the disciples listening to the Great Commission of Jesus? I believe they listened, but it took nearly a decade for the hard shell of their Asian culture to be cracked enough to allow non-Jewish converts into their midst. The contention of the Jerusalem church to the baptism of the Roman centurion Cornelius by Peter noted in Acts chapter 10 and 11 is clear proof that the first wave of converts believed the Christian faith was another sect of Judaism. The Apostle Paul taking the gospel to the Gentiles would cause considerable controversy in the Jerusalem church. There was a group of men from Judea who followed the path of Paul and Barnabas, teaching the new Gentile converts that they must be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be saved. 
The contention became so great that the first council of the church was convened in Jerusalem around 45 AD. The events of this council are recorded in Acts chapter 15. The issue to be discussed was how to blend the Gentile church with the Jerusalem contingent. The dietary customs and cultures of the Jews and the Gentiles were so different, how could such unification occur? The Jerusalem contingent wanted to keep the fledgling church a sect of Judaism, but the great number of Gentiles flooding the church stretched this doctrine to the breaking point. After much prayer and deliberation, the apostles presented the answer to this question given to them by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food, sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. When the Council of Jerusalem instructed the Gentile church to abstain from eating or drinking animals' blood and from eating strangled meat that was not bled, they were being granted divine wisdom that would help them bridge the cultural gap between the Jewish and the Gentile churches. According to Jewish custom, the eating or drinking of animals' blood would result in the person absorbing the soul of the animal with all of its beastly qualities. The wisdom of the early church fathers proved sound. By respecting these customs, the Gentile and Jewish churches could fellowship in the communion celebrations and love feasts. No longer would the two churches be divided. Now they would be recognized as one church standing apart from Judaism. According to Asian custom, women are considered to be of low degree, and the enslavement of women in numerous cults of Oriental paganism is notorious. According to Jewish custom, women were granted only an extremely restricted access to the temple. Women also were only allowed to view synagogue services from behind galleries or curtains. The Christian church, on the other hand, welcomed women, commended them, liberated them socially and spiritually, and granted them privileges of service and ministry they never enjoyed before. According to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, In the eyes of God there is neither male or female. It is the customs of men who separate the sexes into superior and inferior degrees. Several denominations grant women only restricted access to the ministry of God for two reasons. The ignorance of the personality of the Spirit of God and the ignorance of the cultural environment that influenced the Holy Scriptures. The only restriction the Apostle Paul placed on women was in matters of ruling and teaching in the house of God. Women were never to usurp authority over men and thus introduce anarchy. It is important we interpret these controversial passages in the light of history and culture. The Corinthian church was admonished to control the verbal expressions of their women. Is it possible that Paul admonished the Corinthian church to control their women because of a unique problem that existed in that church? The historical record indicates that the city of Corinth was a major pagan center of worship. Women were utilized as ministers in these pagan temples. According to historical records, these women nearly always were agents of demonic possession and expression. Paul's admonishment to the Corinthian church to silence the women was not designed to communicate that women were to be restricted because they were inferior. The admonishment was clearly an attempt by Paul to control the influence of pagan ritual. Should we arbitrarily apply these restrictions to our denominations today with total disregard to the history and the culture of the first epistle of Corinthians, then we are doing women a disservice. How can we ignore the profound impact great women like 
Bowlby Palmer, who was the mother of the American holiness movement of the 19th century, or Amy Semple McPherson and her ministry at Angelus Temple, or even Harriet Mears, who changed the course of Christian education in the 20th century. Clearly, the Holy Spirit does not look on gender as much as the attitude of the heart. Do we, in our own way, attempt to enforce the gender bias of the Asian culture on our church society and structure? This is a question each and every one of us must answer. The third problem the student of the Word will confront is the geographical barrier. At first glance, ignorance of geography would not seem to be a serious hindrance in understanding the Bible, but it can provide insight into the people and places noted in the Bible. The land of Palestine is divided by the deep chasm of the Jordan Valley that is more than 160 miles long. The rift was created by volcanic action and upheaval from the ocean during the Eocene era. During the subsequent Miocene age, periods of great rain and snow covered the area, especially in Lebanon, and this action created the Jordan River running through the valley to the Dead Sea. At the source of the Jordan River, the valley is approximately 1,700 feet above sea level and the deepest point in the valley is the bottom of the Dead Sea at 2,600 feet below the Mediterranean Sea. The 1,200-foot depth of the Dead Sea is solely maintained by evaporation since there is no outlet. Therefore, the sea is very salty and devoid of life. The same cannot be said of the Sea of Galilee, that at its surface is only 680 feet below sea level and full of fish. The Jordan River is among several streams and rivers that water Palestine. This land is still a land of grain, wine and oil, and famous for its fruits. Geologists have confirmed that the current climate and rainfall in Israel has not changed since Bible times. This point brings us to an interesting question. Why were the Judeans prejudicial and antagonistic toward their Galilean countrymen? One reason could be found in consulting a rain chart for the nation of Israel. The annual rainfall of Lower Galilee is between 25 and 30 inches per year, while the lower region of Judea receives less than 15 inches. Remember, consistent rainfall is translated into economic wealth. In simple terms, Judea was poor in wealth but rich in religion, while Galilee was rich in crops but poor in religion. On two separate occasions, the touch of Jesus healed fevers. We see the mother-in-law of Peter being healed in Matthew chapter 8 verse 14 through 15, and the son of a nobleman from Cana in John chapter 4, verse 46 through 54. We may read these events and not give thought to the kind of fever infecting these two individuals, but both persons were from the Galilean area, and this is significant. During the days of Jesus, the shores of the Sea of Galilee raged with malaria, and in the summer, the region is known to be unhealthy still today. This simple fact may have been missed without applying geographical data. The understanding of Bible geography also helps in the areas of Bible prophecy and the geopolitical progression of the empires that influence the nation of Israel. The fourth problem the student of the Word will confront is the historical barrier. We cannot take the Bible out of history, no more than we can take ourselves out of the historical world we live in. 
History impacts each and every one of us, each and every day. George Santanea made that famous quote, Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. A review of world history will only confirm his wisdom. Today, more than ever, we need to understand the documented history associated with Jesus Christ and the Bible. We are living in an anti-Christian secular world being fueled by humanist historical revisionism. These revisionists consider the heretical Gnostic Gospels found at Nag Hammadi, Egypt as scripture in the same way that we value the Bible. There is a field of study in the academic community known as biblical minimalism. Adherence to this discipline state that the Bible is not a valid historical record and should not be used to construct or interpret history. Biblical minimalists construct history from their personal interpretation of the archaeological evidence and only consider biblical accounts of value should they corroborate their personal interpretations. Everything is being done by the secular media to discredit Jesus and the historical accuracy of the Bible. Never before has the need been greater for the student of the Word to have a working knowledge in history. To take biblical narrative out of its historical context can cause confusion and distortion of biblical truth. Let me prove my point by putting three Old Testament scriptural references into historical context. What was the Tower of Babel? The existence of this tower in the Old Testament is confusing. Genesis chapter 11 verse 4 And they said, Go to and let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Our first impression is that the builders of the Tower of Babel wanted to build a structure so high that it would reach the heavens. Is our impression an accurate interpretation of this event? The interlinear Bible casts an interesting light on this verse. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its tops, the heavens. The term, to the heavens, is inserted by the early translators to explain this passage. According to several Hebrew scholars, the phrase should read, with its top for the heavens. This variation in translation confuses the reason for the tower. It was a temple mountain called a Zagurat, dedicated to an early form of zodiac paganism. Another example is the family of Abraham. According to Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2, Terah, the father of Abraham, served other gods in the city of Ur. Abraham was raised in Babylonian paganism. And therefore, God instructed Abraham to leave the land of the Chaldeans to remove him from the peer pressure of his pagan family. Genesis, chapter 16, verse 1 through 16, record the account of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarai. It would be easy to cast a value judgment on Abraham for engaging in sexual relations with Hagar. We must interpret this chapter in the history and culture of 2000 BC. A recent archaeological discovery of tablets dating from around 1600 BC at Nuzai, an ancient trade center in Assyria, put this whole narrative into its historical context. According to the Nuzai marriage law, the marriage custom that influenced Abraham, a barren wife was to furnish her husband with a slave girl in order to provide her husband with a male child. According to the custom, the best slaves would come from Lulliland, an area in the mountains north of Israel. Should the first wife later bear a son, he would rank over a son born to the second wife. We see this occurring in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1 through 10, in reference to Isaac. The law also specified 
that any sons born to this type of relationship must not be expelled. Sarai's demand for the removal of Hagar's son was illegal according to the marriage custom. Putting these narratives into their place in history changes how we see these people. The men and women of the Bible are flesh, blood, and bone the same as we are. When we study the lives of our holy ancestors, we are touching the real humanity of God's holy word. When we study the people and places of the Bible, we are gazing into the lost reflections of our own humanity. Their failures are our failures, and the keys that release the blessings of God in their lives can also work in us. Picture with me that these four barriers are massive canyons that separate us from the ancient apostles and prophets. On one side of the canyon is the student of the word, and on the other is the original author. How can we reach across the 3,500 year time gap that separates us from these authors? We must build a bridge from our point of view to the point of view of the original author. In order to build this bridge, we must have research tools. The Christian market is filled with volumes of research aids designed to bridge the canyon of Bible ignorance. We may study in the original languages by using lexicons and dictionaries. We may study the cultures of the Bible by using cultural research aids. We may study the ancient geography with our Bible atlases. We also may study ancient history with Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias. The ability to put yourself into the human equation of the original authors is another secret to successful Bible research. In the next episode, we will explore the research tools available and learn how to use them. We also will consider the powerful tools of computers and the internet.